and we talk about the kingdom, and we mention the kingdom, and we uh, sing about the kingdom. And I think what we want to do, what we want to come out of this of, is, is have a better understanding of what, really what the kingdom is. So you can't have a kingdom unless there's a king. Anybody ever played Risk? My brother was the king of Risk. He was the king of the world when we played Risk. Nobody could beat my brother when we, when we did that back in the day. And that started out in the neighborhood, and when we were raising kids together, we'd get together after Sunday night, all of us here. We'd go over to Barry Leonard's house, and we'd play Risk. And Tom would beat everybody on somebody else's table. <laughs> no respect at all for anybody else's table. He was going to win on his table or anybody else's when it came to Risk. He was the king of the world on the table. But there is a kingdom, and that means there is a king. And Jesus Christ is our King. We are pursuing this thing of the kingdom because there is a true separation between what the church is and what the kingdom is. The church is not the kingdom. The kingdom is the kingdom and the church is the church. And there's a reason we want to separate those two. Now, the church has a very important function within the kingdom, and that is to be the one and only institution for the kingdom of God through which God will have everything flowing into the world around us. So it is important to know that we are individual members of the church. We gather on Sunday morning, and that's what the church means, ecclesia. It means a gathering. And we gather all over the world on Sunday morning, and sometimes during the middle of the week when we're fanatics. Are you with me? Because <laughs> you can worship wherever you want, whenever you want. Where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am also, Jesus said. And worship can take place. Worship, you don't have to stand to worship. You don't have to sit to worship. If you're a stander, you don't have to sit. If you're a sitter, you don't have to stand to worship. You can worship however you want, this great king of ours. And we do that in church, but wherever we're at, church is. That's the point. And wherever we're at, church is, because that's how God set it up. He said to go into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples, teach them what I've commanded you. So that there's an understanding of who this king is and who this kingdom is. That's the function of the church, to go into the world. I came from a day where you could put a sign out front. The sign could say revival. People go, oh, there was a revival at that church. Some of you came from the same day I came from. I've started saying this. Hi, I'm from the 20th century. I bring you greetings. <laughs> But in the 20th century, you could put a sign out in front of your church that said revival, and people would come. You would have fill a pew night at revival, right? And that organ would get rocking because you would not find guitar or drums in the church in the mid-1970s. <laughs> so as much, as much rocking as you can do with an organ, there was some rocking, and we had fill a pew night. But things are different now. And that's Okay. We don't have to do things the way we did it in 1975. Right? Come on. You don't drive the same car you drove in 1975, right? You're not wearing the same clothes you wore in 1975, right? Well, some of us guys might have sweatshirts from back that far, but I'm just saying. And so there is a difference between the church and the kingdom. The church functions as the one and only institution for which God flows his kingdom blessings into the world around us. And he does that through us. And he'll do it on Sunday morning only, but he intends for it to happen seven days a week, which means we're not always here and we go out. And what he's looking for, what he's looking for, he said, I want you to make disciples. And what he's looking for are disciple makers and disciples. A disciple is a pupil or a follower or a scholar who enrolls in a lifetime, think about this, a lifetime follower of a professor or a teacher. Think about being in school and never getting out, which makes me shudder. But um, as a disciple, that's what we are. 
We're a follower, we're a learner, and who are we becoming more like? We want to catch all the learnings we can from our instructor, from our teacher, and that being Jesus Christ. So to cut to the chase here, we want to become as much like Jesus as we can. That's what a disciple is. A disciple of, a disciple of Jesus Christ is a lifelong learner and follower. And understand who we're following. This is not just any old professor. This is not just any old instructor. We're following an eternal, living, never-changing God who is almighty. And the part that we forget sometimes is He has all authority. Because Matthew 28 says, All authority has been given to me, Jesus said. So not only does He love us, he can do something about it. Sometimes we love people and we can't do anything to fix their situation. But Jesus has all authority. Jesus has all authority. Oh, it's way too quiet. Jesus has all authority to do something about the stuff that bugs us, the stuff that messes us up, the chaos that we have in our life. And the purpose of the church is to go make disciples who follow Jesus who can do something about their stuff. So not only does He love us, he loves us and has the authority and the power to make a difference in our life. That's why we can pray. That's why we can pray and say, Lord, I need you to take this from me. I need your peace. And a loving, all-powerful God says, yeah, I'll give you my peace. I'll give you my peace. So Matthew 13 there's a story. Jesus is teaching in parables. And this is a, a time when, when there was a bunch of crowds. He started out in the house, and the crowds got big. He moved outside. The crowds got bigger, and they're standing on, on next to the water. And so he decides, well, you know what? I, I want people to be able to hear me. So he gets in a boat and backs out, away from the, backs out away from the shore a little bit. And all these people are standing on the shore, and Jesus is in a boat looking back and talking to people. And he says this in Matthew 13, verses 1 through 3. It tells a little of this. It says, On that day, Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea, and great multitudes gathered to him, so that he got into a boat, sat down, and the whole multitude was standing on the beach. And he spoke many things to them in parables. Parable is a story. It's a story with truth in it. You know, it's, it's not just a story that he made up. There's a story with truth. And the cool thing about Jesus is because he is eternal, his truth is eternal. And so the parables he told 2,000 years ago with truth in them, that truth hasn't changed at all. Are you with me? Amen. The truth has not changed. And so there's some parables and stories in there, and, and we'll get to those as we go forward. But I want to jump down to verse 10. Because there, from time to time, Jesus would take his disciples... And he'd gather them together. He said, let me tell you why I'm doing what I'm doing. Right? That's what a teacher does. Because you're learning, right? You ever learned how to work on a car? Which I kind of halfway did. If you ever learned how to work on a car, you could learn how to do it. But then you've got to figure out why you're going to do it. Right? If you're going to work on a car, it's like, well, why do I need to do that? Because I could do it. It might be easy to take that part off and put it back on. But you've got to go... Why am I taking that part off and putting it back on? And that's what Jesus would do. He'd gather his disciples together and said, let me tell you why I'm doing this. And he'd get them together quietly. Verse 10 starts talking about this. So the disciples came to him and says, why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus answered and said to them, and I'm going to read this out of the New Living, okay? His disciples came and asked him, why do you use parables when you talk to people? And he replied, you, meaning you disciples, are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. Gee, God's kingdom has secrets, it says here. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given, and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. That is why I use parables, for they look, but they don't really see. They hear, but they don't really listen or understand. This fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah that says, When you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For the hearts, here he tells why, the hearts of these people are hardened, and their ears cannot hear, they've closed their eyes, so their eyes cannot see, and their ears cannot hear, and their hearts 
cannot understand, and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see, but they didn't see it. And they longed to hear what you hear. They didn't hear it. Why? Because their hearts. But back before he came, he said, man, I wish I could see some of that. I wish I could see Jesus in action. I wish I could see God doing something. And there's a whole bunch of people living now that go, I wish I could see God doing something. And I think sometimes we don't see God doing something because we get mixed up that the church is the end all and we forget about the kingdom. Right? Because see, there's, there's, there's disciples of the Lord and their disciples are lifelong learners. Church people can be lifelong members. Church people can be lifelong members and not be a lifelong learner. And that's why sometimes they can sit in the fieriest of the fiery church meetings where the organ in 1975 was rocking, if organs can rock. <laughs> and they walked out of there unchanged because they were more about being a member than they were about being a learner. Are you with me? So there are people attached to the church. I've been a member of this church. I've been a member of that church all my life. That's good. And they may hear, but they don't understand because they quit trying to learn a long time ago. And maybe they were only in the church ever for just being a member for status. And maybe they just treated the church like a club. Well, we're going to do things this way because I'm a member here. And that has nothing to do with learning about being a disciple of the Lord. People who can't see the kingdom of God generally are those are the people who are not looking for it. People who can't see the kingdom of God are generally those people who are not looking for it. People who can't see the kingdom of God are generally those people who are not looking for the kingdom of God. They're looking for something else, but it's not the kingdom. The church is not the kingdom. The kingdom of not, is not the church. But the church has a very important piece of this. I'm going to quote from Reggie McNeil again from his book, Kingdom Come. He says this, Millions of well-meaning Jesus followers have been led to believe that their primary spiritual identity is their church affiliation and that their devotion to God is measured by the church-centered metrics such as participation in and support of church activities. How many times are you there a week? Well, I've been there three times a week. In 1975, that's how we measured it. I'm there three times a week, sometimes four. Okay, that's how that was measured, right? Some of you remember that. If some of this effort contributed to the advance of the kingdom, well, that'd be one thing. But the sad truth is, much of the activity in the church actually hinders the kingdom expression by gobbling up time and talent and treasure to support, maintain, and perpetuate church programs. Are you with me? Are you with Reggie? Because this is Reggie. Reggie says this, The key to unleashing the promise of the kingdom does not lie in our figuring out how to do church better. Oh, i got to read that again. The key to unleashing the promise of the kingdom does not lie in our figuring out how to do church better. We have great bands, laser light shows, amazing health clubs, incredible worship extravaganzas, engaging sermons, and good coffee. In other words, we do church fabulously well. Obsessing over the issue is an unworthy and unbiblical and even idolatrous pursuit. Instead, the church must brace, embrace and embody a new narrative driven by kingdom and concerns instead of church issues. Now, he didn't put it in the book, but when he was teaching us at MLI, he called it Six Flags Over Jesus. <laughs> he said some of these churches have become Six Flags Over Jesus. With all the stuff going on, he said, but there's, they're missing the point. If we pursue another narrative, if we pursue another f purpose, then the full-fledged kingdom purpose, I'm telling you, we're going to miss out on what God has for us. Are you with me? If we pursue another narrative, if we do something other than what we've been put here to do as the church, we're going to miss out on the kingdom. 
The full-fledged kingdom purpose. As kingdom disciples, king, and a disciple is what? Is a lifelong learner. A disciple is a lifelong learner. A disciple is what? As disciples, God is inviting us to participate in His kingdom for a world campaign. It includes all the things that Jesus showed us how to do and be concerned with when He was here. Reggie puts it this way. He says, the kingdom of heaven is never irrelevant. And he's right. The kingdom of God is never irrelevant. The kingdom of heaven, it call, he calls it, is never irrelevant. God's plan and purpose in the world are always cutting edge because the kingdom is all about bringing healing to the afflicted. Listen, healing to the afflicted, binding up the brokenhearted, releasing people from captivity, and redeeming everything diminished by sin. And let's cut to the chase. Everything's been diminished by sin until it's been redeemed by God. Do you know... And I forget that I, I didn't look up the, the figure, the stat. Do you know that right now, and I think it's somewhere between 30 and 40 percent, of everybody, of all of us gathered together, 30 to 40 percent of all of us gathered together, 30 to 40 percent of us are on antidepressants in North America. Because stuff has eaten us up. What's been diminished by sin? Our life. Our emotions, the stress, the stuff like that, it's eaten us alive. I'm not criticizing the people that are on taking those things. I'm just saying, what has been diminished by sin? Our life has been diminished by sin. And it's causing people to go, I got to have some kind of relief. I got to have some kind of relief. I made this, I put this sermon together two, three weeks ago. So, what I'm about to say has nothing to do with what, what in the last week or so. Do you know that there is a 33% increase in suicide since 2012? When we were in Danville, of the people, the, the kids that our kids knew, their group of friends, do you know there was 12 of those kids who took their own life? Before they reached, I think, 20, early 20s. Because sin has diminished life. And the kingdom of God's purpose is to give people hope and peace. He said, my peace I leave with you. And peace eliminates chaos, right? It doesn't mean that the storm goes away. Remember the disciples. They were in the boat with Jesus. And Jesus' will was, guys, I want to go to the other side. And they're going, great, we're going to the other side with Jesus. And a storm comes up, and they are in a panic because they wake up Jesus and say, don't you even care, we're about to die. I mean, that's pretty tough talk to the Lord. He said, little faith, oh, you, I told you we're going to the other side. He stands up and says, peace be still. Water's calm, winds quit blowing. But you know, sin has diminished our life. Has caused chaos in our life, and it takes away the peace that God gives us. And as disciples, disciples, lifelong learners, there's stuff that God has to bring us through. It's not all there at one time, right? He meets us where we're at. Thank God, He meets us where we're at, right? And He says, "Let me take it from here." I'll take it from here, and I, I want you to follow me. Come follow me, and I'm going to get you away from all this. And he begins to move us away from the chaos and the stuff that eats us alive. Guess what? He's saying, I want, my will is to, to go this way, and we're going, I want to go that way, because I don't want to be back here anymore. And you know what? You still may have to go through a storm, and the waters may splash up, and we may get wet. But that doesn't mean he's forgotten us. Are you with me? It does not mean he's forgotten us. The kingdom of heaven and our pursuit of the kingdom of heaven can replace and replay, repair and replenish what's missing in our lives. Do you believe that? The kingdom of heaven can replace, can repair and replenish 
with what's missing in our lives because kingdom disciples, and remember that's lifelong learners. A disciple is a lifelong learner. A lifelong kingdom disciple learner has access to the kingdom to restore us. Turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 13, same chapter, jump down to verse 44. Here's what Jesus says about the kingdom. He says the kingdom is so valuable. And here's where we kind of get off a little bit track. We kind of get sideways, right? Because we've built the church to be that place. We go to the church to meet God, and we can do that. We can do I'm not saying that it's wrong to come to church to meet God, because that's what we want to do when we're here. But Jesus puts this perspective of the kingdom like this. He says there's such high value of the kingdom that he puts it this way. The kingdom of heaven is like, whenever you see... In the Bible, the kingdom of heaven is like, pay attention, because he's helping us understand what all this is about. It says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. And when he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned and bought it. What's he saying there? He's saying, you know, this guy was walking along in a field and he found gold. Let's just call it gold. It's a great treasure, whatever it happens to be. And he said, oh, I don't want anybody else to find that. So he covered it back up. He went and sold everything. He said, I want to buy that field. Because what's in that field is worth way more than what I own altogether. So I'm going to take and buy all that field. And he went and dug up the treasure. And all of a sudden he has full access to the treasure that's in that field, right? You with me? And that is what Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is like. He said, if we're willing to have a full pursuit of the kingdom, it's worth being all in. It's, it's worth being all in. I'm going to sell everything I've got. I'm going, I'm going all in on that field. And that's what being the lifelong learner is about. It's like there's a lot of other opinions We have access to tons of opinions, and that's fine. But the lifelong learner of Jesus is going, man, there's there's no other wisdom greater than his wisdom. There's no other peace greater than his peace. It's a peace that surpasses all understanding. It says in Philippians, I can't figure this out, but I should be a mess, but I'm not. And that's the peace that surpasses all understanding, and it's worth being all in for that. It's worth being all in to say, man, I want everything that's in that field. And the kingdom of heaven, several times, Jesus equates the kingdom of God to to the land, to the earth. And we'll look at another one down the road. But the kingdom of heaven has more value than a dynamic worship experience. You've heard me say this before. Because that's how we define church. We go, it's a dynamic worship experience. Which is fine. I'm not against that. I like it when the organ's rocking. Please, please, I don't want to bring the organ back. Um, But the kingdom is worth more than that. We want and need something. We all want and need something. We all want and need something that's going to satisfy seven days a week. Right? We can go out and have a nice Sunday meal, but if you don't eat anything else by Wednesday... Somebody's going to get hungry, right? We eat seven days a week. And our pursuit is a a seven-day-a-week pursuit because he's a a seven-day-a-week God. So talk to someone who's brokenhearted, and they would give anything or everything to buy that field and feel joy again, right? Someone who's brokenhearted, they say, you know what, there's joy in that field. says, well, I want it all. Can I buy it? Someone who's brokenhearted would give anything, they give everything to feel joy again. Someone who's in an emotional avalanche would give anything or everything to feel peace again. Someone who's in a financial avalanche would go, man, I I just wish I could make the month break even. You know, And the Lord says he'll, he'll give peace in the midst of our trouble. And guess what? 
The most underused verse in, in the Bible is Matthew 28, where he says, all authority has been given to me. Not only do I love you, I can do something about it. Do you trust me? Do you trust me with that? Philippians 4. You want to turn to Philippians 4. In the midst of whatever physical, emotional, spiritual avalanche that you might be going through, Philippians 4 has hope. Philippians 4 has hope. For whatever spiritual, whatever emotional, whatever physical stuff we're going through, it says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your forbearing spirit, what's that mean? Your relaxed spirit, your at-peace spirit. Let your at-peace spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence and anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on that. What's he saying? He said, don't worry about stuff. Let your mind dwell on the good stuff. Is there something to worry about? Is there an enemy at the door? Are the wolves surrounding the house? Maybe. He said, but don't focus on that. Focus on me. Whatever is good, whatever is honorable, any excellence, anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these. And when we've done all that, look at verse 9. The things you have learned and heard and seen in me, practice these things, Paul says, and the God of peace shall be with you. If we focus on the good stuff, the God of peace is with us. If we focus on the good stuff, He's bringing to us peace that we can't explain. I don't know why I'm not worried. I'm just not worried. Right? Don't you want to be there? That's what we all want. And that comes when we are lifelong learners, not a lifelong member of the church. Let's come on, bud. Peace is a mystery at times. You see people who are at peace, and you go, they, they, there's no reason they should be at peace. You know? And Jesus said, I want to explain to you the mysteries of the kingdom. That's what he told the disciples, verse, verse 10 down in there, Matthew 13. He said, let me explain. You, you get to see some mysteries of the kingdom. Nobody else is going to get to see because you're all in with me. You're all in with me. And because you're all in with me, I'm going to show you things that nobody else is going to get to see because not everybody else is in with me. I want you to be all in with me. Kingdom disciples are lifelong learners and followers, and yet they get to see and experience what spectators don't get to see. I know there's a football game on today. I don't want to talk about football. All I know is that in two weeks, pitchers and catchers report for duty. So get this game over with so we can get on with something that matters. I know this, that in the summer, every day, and this is why baseball is a better analogy than football is, every day, people gather for worship in baseball stadiums everywhere. You with me? People gather for worship in baseball stadiums everywhere. They show up wearing kingdom clothes, the kingdom of baseball, that is, right? They're wearing their favorite player's jersey. They're wearing cap of their favorite team. They show up ready for worship. And if that game goes three hours, not a problem. Game goes into extra innings, right? All the better. You want to go to extra innings today? <laughs> 
If that worship service goes into extra innings, not a problem. But here's the deal. These people who show up in the kingdom attire, the ball caps and the favorite team's jersey and stuff, they'll set up in the stands and go, oh, why did he swing at that pitch? He should never have swung at that pitch. They'll give a critique. The difference is, though, the guy swinging at the pitch and them, these people who are critiquing said he shouldn't have swung, aren't even in the game. They're not even in the game. Oh, they look like they're in the game because they showed up for worship that day. They look like they're in the game because they're wearing all the same attire. And they even have a worship song that they sing. Everybody know what that is? Take me out to the ball game, right? So, so we sing the worship song. We're all in with that. Trouble is, everybody sitting up high is not in the game. Kingdom disciples are in the game. Church members might just sit and criticize. I wouldn't have taken that pitch at all. What's he thinking? But a lifelong learner is going to be down there. And you know what? The manager says, it's okay. We'll get him next time. Because our, our manager, our Lord and Savior, who we're trying to become like, is saying, We'll show you how to do this. Let's go take some batting practice. Let's go take some pitching practice. Kingdom disciples are lifelong learners. This quote is too good not to give you again. This is Reggie again from his book, Kingdom Come. And he says this, the kingdom of God is never irrelevant Say it. The kingdom of God is never irrelevant. God's plan and purpose in the world is always cutting edge because the kingdom is all about bringing healing to the afflicted by binding up the brokenhearted, releasing people from captivity and redeeming everything diminished by sin. We don't know what somebody else is going through. And our mission as a disciple might be to Go be an ear for somebody just to hear what they, to get something off their chest. It might be to go bring a cold cup of water. It might be to bring a bag of groceries. Stories told of an aunt that I never met years ago. Actually, uh, Mike Mack's great grandmother. And Mike Mack's great grandmother, they didn't have any food in the house. And so she grabbed who was Howard and all his brothers and sisters and said, children, you need to pray. You need to pray that God brings us some food. And it was just not long that somebody came to the door and said, you know, God put me on your heart. And I brought him some, two sacks of groceries, I think is the story. Mike's grandfather told me that. Sometimes that's our mission. Doesn't seem like a big deal. It's a big deal because we don't know what people are going through. Kingdom disciples are lifelong learners. Mess up, it's okay. Pick up, keep going. Don't give up. He isn't going to forget us. Maybe you today are here and you're brokenhearted. You go, Steve, I'm a kingdom follower and I'm broken hearted I'm carrying stuff nobody knows what I'm carrying let me tell you it matters to God it matters to God he cares he hasn't forgotten you it matters to him So I want to pray in closing today for the brokenhearted. Now I want to pray that we commit to redeeming everything diminished by sin because that is our kingdom call. But if you're here today and you're brokenhearted, 
and there's stuff going on that only you and Jesus knows, it's okay that only you and Jesus know. But I want you to know he cares. He hasn't forgotten you. He wants to take it on, and let me tell you, he's got the authority to take it on. Nobody else wrapped in skin might be able to do it, but he can. He loves us, and he has the authority to do something about it, because all authority has been given to him. It's going to take a few minutes. Just take a time and pray. If you want to come tap me on the shoulder, come tap me on the shoulder. I'll pray with you. I'm going to be up here praying. Just take a few minutes and pray.